So, good morning and good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this presentation of the first quarter results 2020 for Sandvik. With us today, we have our new CEO, Stefan Wieding, uh, as well as myself, uh, Thomas Elias, on Group CFO. So, please, Stefan, take it away. Thank you, Thomas, and also I would like to welcome you to this first quarter report for 2020. Uh, I think I've known or met and talked to a few of you in my previous uh, life, but for most of you this is the first time we meet, uh, so I would like to say I'm happy to meet you virtually, although I would have wished it was under slightly different practical uh, circumstances. Uh, the setup for today is we're going to have a couple of slides to begin with. Um, where I will share some of my first impressions and priorities uh, in the role. I will give a short update on uh, the corona situation and then we'll dive into the actual report. So uh, let's get started then. Next slide, please. So uh, I was happy that, let's say, the first five, six weeks in the role, uh, things were fairly normal. I could travel around, uh, meet the people, see our operations. Uh, I have to say I'm very impressed with the people I met. Uh, knowledgeable people, passionate, uh, and with a clear business focus. Uh, it's also uh, evident uh, when you're out there that the new operating model that we put in place a couple of years ago with a decentralized model uh, is, is taking hold. Uh, you can see we, the responsibility uh, for decisions and the accountability for decisions is out there in the business with the divisional management where it should be. So I'm, I'm really pleased to see that. Obviously, we still have a ways to go, and these things take a long time to get fully implemented, but uh, I think we have made very good progress in the last years. Then it's also clear uh, that we do have uh, strong market positions in most of our segments. We have good technology, and we are number one and number two uh, in the segments where most of our divisions operate. So overall, uh, if I take these uh, points, I think it shows we have a very solid foundation uh, first now to take us through a, a challenging period ahead, but then also to grow the company uh, more uh, longer term. My initial focus areas obviously has been, first of all, uh, coming from the outside uh, to get to know the people, uh, the businesses, and some of our key customers. Uh, already coming in uh, to the job in this quarter, we were in a slowdown. Uh, and we have already announced uh, last year efficiency uh, and cost reduction measures. So uh, that was also one of my uh, first priorities to ensure that we continue to execute as, as we have said on that. Uh, then we have, of course, uh, SMT, uh, where the internal separation project is ongoing uh, and will be ready uh, now around uh, the summertime. As, as previously communicated. Uh, and then uh, the idea is then that then the board will uh, evaluate and discuss potential next steps. And this period now when I come in is obviously now a good time to, to uh, get to know that business more uh, and form my own opinions around SMT. Uh, and then, of course, uh, growth. Uh, we have gone through uh, you know, stabilization and profitability uh, over the last couple of years. And it's clear that the focus is now uh, more and more on growth, both organic and through M&A. Then the corona situation has, of course, emphasized the priorities around execution, savings, and efficiency. Uh, and that's, uh, that's very clear. So next slide, please. Uh, on the corona situation, uh, as we have said, Q1, was largely as expected. Uh, we had the disturbances in China in the beginning of the quarter, like most, uh, with the extended closure at uh, the Chinese New Year. Uh, we could say that for us, uh, China has recovered well. Uh, if you look uh, uh, at the quarter uh, overall, uh, we were up in China for the group. Uh, SMS, that was driven uh, by SMRT. Uh, SMS, the short cycle business, is flattish or, or slightly down minus 1% uh, for the quarter. That obviously hides a lot of drama within the quarter uh, with a very big drop in the beginning and then a strong recovery at the end of the quarter. I think we cannot really say yet what is the sort of sustainable run rate there. 
uh, obviously in the in the recovery there's also a lot of catch up uh, involved and potentially even uh, buffering for a, you know, a feared second shutdown if that will happen so we don't really know we can just say that china has recovered well for us in the quarter uh, then in March, obviously, we had a global uh, escalation of, of the situation. Uh, we have been impacted by production closures and so on in those regions that have locked down, uh, and also in other places where, for example, for health and safety reasons, we had to uh, temporarily close down or, or, or more permanently for now reduce uh, the capacity of, of plants. Uh, but I think we have managed that well. We have been able to move around uh, capacity as needed. Uh, so we have continued to be able to serve our customers there. Uh, and on the supply and distribution, there's been a lot of issues during the quarter. Uh, for example, most of our uh, air freight is, is through passenger uh, traffic, which obviously has been impacted. Uh, but um, and also we have had quite uh, elevated sick leaves in many locations that have also made things more complicated to manage. But um, uh, I think the team has done a tremendous job to manage that. So it has also not really had a significant impact on our business. We have had some extended customer delivery times, maybe slightly higher freight costs and so on, but overall not a significant impact. Then, of course, we saw at the very end of March a sharp decline in SMS and the short cycle business also, uh, you know, in SMT, we know are, are, are correlated to SMS. Uh, and and the, the drop in the week was 25% organically uh, year over year. Now, that was the, the first week where we saw the impact. Uh, so we will, of course, have to wait and see going through April now, uh, if uh, you know how, how the run rate will be going through the quarter, uh, we cannot really comment on April. We think it's not really relevant to compare now these weeks because we have an Easter timing effect. Uh, so um, I think when, once we are through April, we will have a better idea of where the uh, the, the new run rate is for now, so to say. Uh, overall, going forward, uh, we are fully dependent on how the actual health and virus situation evolves, uh, and of course government decisions, where to close down, where to start to open up, and so on. And I think you are probably as, as suitable as us to, to try to understand or model that uh, and, and how, what kind of impact that will have, given our exposure in various segments that, that you are aware of. Uh, so that's what we wanted to say on Corona. Now let's uh, go to the next slide, please, and jump into the actual report. We had an order decline of 11% organically. Uh, of course, that is, again, all-time high compares. Uh, we were happy to see an additional major order in SMT in the energy sector. Uh, we could also note continued protracted, um, protracted uh, decision times uh, on the order side in SMRT. Uh, we have had that for some time, and if anything, it was a little bit accentuated uh, at the end uh, of the period in March. Uh, of course, uh, we continue to see the decline in the short cycle business, SMS minus 12%, uh, and that also is relevant for um, SMT. If we take away major orders, SMT is minus 9% for orders. And then, as I mentioned, the uh, drop in SMS at the end of March. Uh, this, uh, we also had revenue decline of 7% organically, uh, which obviously is the main driver for putting pressure on our adjusted EBIT margin, uh, which is 16.6 excluding metal prices and 15.8 including the metal price effect. Uh, we also should note here that we had a, um, an FX impact uh, related to hedges in SMRT. Uh, that had an 80 basis point impact at group level and 180 basis points in SMRT. That was not uh, something we expected, but obviously it is part of the results. Uh, then uh, we did also see good savings filtering through 360 million in the period uh, uh, in line with what we have said from, uh, from the announcements last year. The cash flow, uh, 3.1 billion uh, in the period. Uh, we have a strong balance sheet gearing is now, the net gearing is now down to 0 0.17. Uh, 
And if we include on growth credit lines, we have over 30 billion sec of accessible cash at the end of the period. Despite uh, this solid financial foundation, uh, the board, as a precautionary measure, uh, decided to withdraw the dividend proposal, although the board also intends to reevaluate that when the uh, situation is solved. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. If we look at the market development overall, uh, we start with our major markets, uh, both Europe and uh, North America down 14%. Uh, North America would have been down 9 if we exclude the major orders uh, in SMT. Uh, on Asia, minus 6, uh, as I've already said, that uh, if, you, if you take China in that, we were actually up 10% for China uh, overall, driven by SMRT, uh, minus 1 if we only look at SMS. Uh, if we look at our major um, verticals or segments, uh, it's pretty much down across the board except for construction. Uh, if we look uh, you know, at general engineering and automotive, uh, obviously being weak, uh, also going into the quarter, and then the uh, situation has not uh, improved uh, as the corona situation has been escalated during the quarter. Aerospace, I would say, was slightly weaker also going into the quarter as we started to see in January some impacts from the, the Boeing 737 uh, MAX uh, production uh, uh, closure. Uh, and that, of course, that has also been impacted further uh, later in the period. Uh, sequential trend is primarily down, although we have still held up reasonably well in Australia and South America. Next slide, please. Uh, orders, I think I've covered m the most of the things here, uh, minus 11% organically, but you can see in the graph there that we had very tough compares uh, in the same period last year, uh, and I'll come to that a little bit when we cover the, the business areas. Uh, revenues, minus 7% organically, uh, driven by SMS, minus 12, SMRT, minus 5, uh, SMT, minus uh, if we uh, would have included the alloy surcharges, they would actually have been down than minus five in the period. Next slide, please. EBIT development, uh, as I said, uh, pressure primarily from volume decline of minus seven percent. Uh, if we uh, normalize for the uh, metal prices, it would have been 16.6. Uh, reported adjusted was 15.8. Uh, then I mentioned the uh, FX uh, revelation and hedge impact in SMRT in the period, uh, driven by very volatile currencies in some of the, the mining markets, uh, that had an impact of around 80 basis points at group level. Uh, uh, without that, we would have been at around 17 and a half on the margin side. And I think that gives a good indication on more how we have responded to the overall volume drop at the group level. Uh, of course, uh, good uh, uh, positive impact from the savings of 360 million in the period. Next slide, please. To go into uh, the different BAs, uh, starting with SMRT, uh, minus eight on order, minus five on revenues. Uh, on the order side, uh, the equipment are down in the high teens. That's primarily driven by mechanical cutting. Uh, they are the ones that had very high uh, compares in terms of order intake last year. Also a little bit on crushing and screening. Otherwise, I think also equipment's held up fairly well. Uh, as the market is largely stable, it's actually down minus 2% uh, in the quarter, uh, but largely stable uh, considering the environment. Uh, and then, again, continue to have somewhat protracted lead times in the customer decision process. Uh, and again, potentially even uh, slightly then uh, escalated at the end of the quarter. Uh, on the margin, uh, 17 this year versus 18 last year, there were a, a slight decline in absolute adjusted EBIT from the uh, volume drop. But actually, uh, from a uh, margin perspective, they were margin accretive uh, due to uh, good savings and, and good handling of, of the volume drop. So this decline is really driven by FX and construction impacts. If you take away this hedge and revaluation impact, operationally, they would have been around 19%. 
Next slide, please. Machining solutions then, minus 12 on both orders and revenues. Uh, I think I've talked to most of the dynamics there, end of quarter and in China. Uh, margin decline, of course, uh, driven by uh, the volume drop, 520 basis points, uh, partially offset them by savings of 210. We also have a negative impact from destocking around 70 basis points. This is a little bit due to that we sequentially reduced absolute inventory since December, but primarily it's driven by a bridge effect where we last year actually restocked or overstocked. So you get a, a negative bridge effect there versus last year. Uh, so this means uh, if we take away that impact, uh, we are down then about 300 basis points on a negative volume drop of 12%, which we think is quite okay for, for a business like SMS. Uh, of course, very much helped by the existing savings initiatives. And then we also announced uh, earlier in the quarter the intention to close one of our plants in Germany. Next slide, please. SMT, uh, order intake minus 14, minus 9, excluding major orders. Uh, here we are happy that we could book uh, major orders in the energy sector uh, earlier in the quarter. It means that we have now filled our order backlog for uh, this quite high value added business for the remainder of the year. Of course, uh, if the current oil price levels uh, continue where they are, we will have uncertainty in the midterm uh, in that business, meaning in 2021. Uh, but that, that remains to be seen how things evolve in the next quarter or two. Uh, in the short cycle part of SMT, uh, we see continued decline then in standardized as well as Cantal. And they are at a minus nine if you exclude the major orders. Uh, margin uh, down from 10.4 to 9, uh, primarily driven by volume drop, partly offset by 50 basis points improvements from the savings. And with that, I'll hand over to Thomas to take us to some of the more detailed financials. Thank you, Stefan. <coughs> and uh, let's uh, immediately uh, move to the uh, next slide and uh, jump into the financial summary for the first quarter. And uh, if I may draw your attention to the upper right-hand corner. Let's start with the top line. Uh, orders down 11%, the revenue 7% organically, as you have heard. Uh, currency impacted uh, the top line with 2% positively. Structure uh, minus zero. We have uh, a couple of acquisitions, one in SMS and one in SMRT, uh, adding uh, to the growth, but we also have the Varel uh, a divestiture, uh, which happened uh, in early March, March 3rd. So we're losing a month now of RL, and this will, of course, then continue for 12 months going forward in the bridge. So all in all, uh, minus 9% uh, for orders and 6% for revenues. If we then walk down the income statement, uh, the earnings uh, landed at 3.7 billion. The operating earnings compared to 4.6 billion a year ago, that's minus 18% and a margin of 15.8 uh, compared to 18.3. We will look at the bridge uh, in a minute here. Finance net minus 416 compared to minus 378 a year ago. We will look at that as well in some more detail. Uh, tax rate 23.1%, that's at the lower uh, end of the range. Uh, working capital, uh, just up a little bit uh, in fixed currencies, but uh, given the uh, top line uh, reduction, the more, uh, relative number came up to 26.8%. Cash flow uh, almost on par with last year, 3.1 billion. Returns 16%, and uh, earnings per share uh, minus 15%. Uh, next slide, please. Let's look at the bridge. So here we have the journey from uh, Q1 19 to Q1 2020. And if we start with the <coughs> organic development, minus 7%, uh, that's uh, just short of 1.9 billion down on the top line, 726 million down on the uh, er operating earnings. That's a leverage of 39% and a dilution of 170 points. Currency, uh, diluted 30 points in the bridge, I should say. Uh, metal prices diluted uh, 50 basis points in the bridge. 
and structure, uh, well, it is zero. It, it's a little bit less than zero, but uh, rounded off zero. Uh, so that's from 18.3 to 15.8 percent. Now, let's stop a little bit uh, here uh, for a few seconds on, on currency. Uh, here you can see that we, we had a positive effect on the top line, 427, uh, and the total, total currency effect was plus 12 million. But behind the 12 million, we have quite some movements. The translation effect and the transactional currency effect was more than 200 million positive. Uh, but then we had negative uh, effects of uh, 200 million uh, on uh, revaluation uh, of, uh, of hedges and, and open items in accounts payable and accounts receivable. And uh, as Stefan has already touched upon, uh, it was a little bit unexpected. We had too many open positions, uh, especially on the mining side, for various reasons, timing reasons, et cetera, et cetera. And this happened exactly at the time as the currency started to go very much up and down. Uh, this is, um, uh, of course, uh, more of a, just a Q1 situation. Some of it will come back, but not all of it. So let's move to the next slide. Uh, and here we just want to update you on where we are on the savings plan that we announced after Q2 last year, in July last year. Uh, we took a charge in Q3 of 1.6 billion for savings of 1.7 uh, billion, and we have now achieved a run rate of 1.4. Uh, 2,000 employees are affected of uh, an estimated 2,500. And the remainder of this program will basically fall out uh, in the second quarter uh, of this year. Next slide, please. Now, let's stop a bit on the finance net. And uh, we can start at the top line here. The underlying interest net, which is what we're guiding for, is coming down nicely. It's on minus 126 million now. It was minus 168 a year ago. Minus 126, uh, that's in line with the guidance we have for the full year, which is 500 million in interest net. Pensions, bank charges, etc., are pretty stable and will just continue uh, along these lines. But <clears throat> on the last line here, you can see FX and other asset classes. Uh, that's uh, minus 210 million. Uh, what we have here are uh, hedges which do not yet have a corresponding item in the balance sheet. So these are hedges for electricity contracts, for raw material purchases, and for large orders. Uh, which hadn't materialized yet. And uh, as we don't do hedge accounting, you have to take the temporary revaluation in the finance net. This will all go back, 100% of it, <laughs> back into the operating earnings when they appear in the balance sheet. This is nothing we can guide about, uh, really. Uh, we, you, you never know where, where this is going to end up. And, and in any case, it is just temporary revaluations, which for accounting reasons, have to show up here in the finance net. But we can give you some help if you want to model it yourself. The electricity contracts, which is basically for, for the steelworks uh, in SMT, uh, has an outstanding balance of around uh, 500 million. Uh, the raw material hedges, which is mainly nickel and a little bit of molybdenum, <coughs> is normally around four to 500 million. And the FX hedges for order, large orders, which we have received, but we haven't started work on it yet, it normally has a balance of around five billion. So uh, based on that, you can model depending on where you think the market is going. Uh, so uh, next page, please. Let's talk a bit about the tax rate. The reported tax rate was 21.8%. Uh, and in this quarter, we had quite some one-offs. Uh, we had some uh, uh, restructuring going on in, uh, in SMS. We took a charge for that. We have um, uh, the, the last item from the Varel divestiture. That was a loss, of, or not a loss, but it was a negative impact of 500 million, etc. It was close to a billion. Those charges uh, booked as items affecting comparability doesn't all are not all tax deductible. Uh, so when that happens, the tax rate gets pushed up. So if you adjust for that, you end up on 19.2. So 19.2, of course, is a good and low level, but it's not that fun. <laughs> it's not that good, really, because what we have in the quarter as well is, uh, apart from items affecting comparability, are some inventory valuation uh, movements, 
to a large extent connected to internal pro uh, profit eliminations, etc., which has given uh, us some let's say, tax income or some tax credits uh, in deferred taxes. So if you take that away, because that, that will not repeat itself, if you take that away, you end up with 23.1%, which is more like an underlying uh, run rate for the tax rate uh, this year. The guidance is 23 to 25, and 23.1 is it's in the range, even though it's at the lower end of the range. So let's go to the next slide uh, and, and take a look at some balance sheet items. Um, working capital uh, slightly up in fixed rates. Uh, look at the right-hand side. You can see that uh, in SMS, uh, it's, it's behaving uh, nicely. Uh, SMRT, a little bit up for seasonal reasons, and s and is, uh, is a little bit more volatile. Next slide, please. Cash flow, uh, not too far from, from the cash flow for a year ago, uh, 3.1 billion. Uh, ne next slide, please. And here we have the net debt slide. And uh, as you can see here now, we end the quarter with a net cash position of 1.4. Uh, and, and just to, to tie back a little bit to what Stefan said here on the accessible cash, we have 17.5 billion in cash. We have committed credit lines of 9 billion. Uh, we have more bilaterals that we can uh, enter into if we want to. That means that we have more than 30 billion in cash and uh, undrawn credit lines, both committed and uncommitted. We do not have any maturities. Uh, you can see that in the backup material. We don't have any maturities <clears throat> for this year. There will be three and a half billion in maturities uh, uh, next year. And then the rest of the debt portfolio is spread out uh, in time, um, quite a long time uh, into the future. So the cash situation as such uh, is good. Uh, next slide, please. Now let's look at some of the guidance here. We guided 150 million on the underlying currency effect. We came in on 224. That's transaction and translation. Uh, the total currency effect uh, with a, bit, a little bit unexpected revaluation um, operation uh, in the balance sheet was plus 12. The metal prices in quarter was 201. We guided for 200. The breach effect was 116, but in quarter it was 201. Uh, the CapEx came in at 0.7, the interest net uh, 100 million or 126 million, and the tax rate was 23.1%. So if we look at the next slide, uh, we have a little bit of an update uh, for, for, the, for the full year guidance here now. We now say that for CapEx, uh, we will be below 4 billion. <clears throat> that is an update. We previously said it's going to be around or about 4 billion. Now, of course, given these times, we have put a, a, a little bit of a cap uh, on our capex. We're going to take it down, so it will definitely be below four billion for the full year. Uh, for currency effect <clears throat> for the next quarter, uh, transaction and translation, which is the only thing we can guide for, we expect plus 100 for the second quarter. Uh, metal prices, uh, with the prices that we had at the end of the, uh, of the quarter, we believe it's going to be minus 150. For Q2, uh, interest net we keep at minus 500 million, and the tax rate will uh, continue. Uh, we haven't changed the range. It's going to be between 23 and 25 percent for for the for the full year. It keeps coming down slowly, slowly, uh, because most of the markets where we are big and where we are profitable are tending to move the corporate tax rate down towards 20 percent. Uh, yeah, and. Um, with that, I think I uh, will uh, hand over to Stefan again for conclusions and summary. Thank you so much. I think it's fair to say now, uh, following this quarter, uh, is all about managing uh, our near-term challenges uh, as resilient as possible. Uh, you saw that we already in March uh, announced additional uh, savings measures. Um, we have focused initially on the short term and, and the temporary savings uh, because they have immediate uh, impact. And that should provide another um, 1.5 billion in additional savings for the remainder of this year. And then we have uh, 1 billion in structural savings, uh, 100 million that we announced in January, and then 0.9 billion that we announced end of March. And that would be 
fully into effect uh, by the end of next year. Uh, we will, of course, continue to monitor the, the market development, and if needed, we will not hesitate to take additional actions if that's necessary. What we will not do, however, is jeopardize the long-term uh, competitive advantage of the group. Uh, while we do these actions, we are also taking into account the fact that we need to be ready also for a ramp-up and uh, the period that will come after this, hopefully as short as possible, uh, downturn. Uh, one of the reasons we can do that is, of course, that we are in a robust financial shape. Uh, we have a solid balance sheet, as Thomas mentioned, uh, over 30 billion sec in cash accessible to us if needed. And we are in a net cash position at the end of the period. This uh, we will use not only to come through this period in a position of strength, uh, we will also use it uh, to take any M&A opportunities that might arise even during this period. We have a strong balance sheet and uh, we want to grow the company and we want to add acquisitions both in our core business uh, but also, if uh, possible, add a good technology and know-how that will help us drive growth in the longer term. Thank you. That is all, and I hand back to Thomas. Yeah. Uh, do we have any online questions? That we. Oh, not really. Okay. <clears throat> then, um, operator, I think we'll move into the uh, to the um, uh, to, to the cell phone line. So. Uh, May I remind everybody to limit yourself to two questions each, and if you have more questions, you, I would like to ask you to, to uh, line up again. So, please, operator. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question for the speakers, please press zero 01 on your telephone keypad. Our first question comes from the line of Manus Kuba from UBS. Please go ahead. Hi, Manus here from UBS. First, uh, on SMS, I think you mentioned a 25% decline in the last week of, of March. How should we think about this going into, into, the, into the second quarter? Is, is this as bad as it gets now with the automotive OEMs opening up, or uh, how should we think about the early part of Q2? Uh, I mean, we, we don't know uh, where this will end up. Uh, I mean, it was the first week uh, of, of the drop, and of course, what it, what it tells us is that we are now being impacted and, and quite substantially. Uh, as I said, now we have Easter weekends and stuff, so uh, we don't really draw uh, too much conclusions from how April has started. Uh, the decline has started. Um, the rest of the quarter is going to be impacted more by the virus spread and political decisions. Uh, you know, anything that we can see or draw any conclusions from uh, in, in the past couple of weeks. So I, I think you... Yeah. Knowing our exposure to various verticals and so on, you can probably model or guess how this will evolve as, as good as we can. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much. And, and the second question on, on SMRT on the aftermarket side. You mentioned a uh, flat demand there, I think, year over year. Uh, have you seen any tendencies of the miners started to pull back spending here in early Q2, or is it still stable? Uh, yeah, in Q2. Q1, we we were largely stable, as we said. Uh, I don't have any commentary on on, on no, Q2 as of now. Thank you so much. I'll get back in. And the next question comes from the line of Max Yates from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Just my my first question is on the the cost savings. So the additional one and a half billion of, of temporary savings you announced. How quickly would you expect those to, to feed through to the P&L? And, and should we expect that kind of we get a, a third of those uh, coming through in, in Q2 already? Or will it be a slightly delayed effect based on uh, putting, putting the measures in place? That's my first question. I think you, this is how we have thought about this. Uh, we, on the one side, we, we're not going to delay, so to say, savings unnecessarily. Rather, we, we, we want to uh, you know, push the brakes as hard as we can now in Q2, since it's reasonable, at least with what we know now, to assume that Q2 is going to be you know, uh, 
the top quarter. Um, so that's the one side, so we're going to push as hard as we can. On the other hand, of course, the risk in some cases maybe a slight delay if we talk about April 1st as the benchmark. I can say that some of the measures went into effect uh, fully in April 1st and, and slightly maybe even before that a few days. Uh, then there are others where they also adjust to existing backlog and so on and ramp down as you know, aligned with the business. Uh, so there are a little bit different dynamics there, but I think you can, you know, you can assume fairly uh, safely that it should be around the third. Okay, and and maybe just to follow up for Thomas on the on the managing the inventories for for SMS, obviously that kind of started through the the back end of of last year. How how are you thinking about production levels? Going into Q2 and kind of knowing knowing what we do now, would you have underproduced a little bit more aggressively in Q1, given obviously sitting here now things spread more quickly than than we thought, and and would kind of the the 200 basis point impact we saw in the second half of last year be a good guide for for how maybe we should think about this in Q2? Thank you. Oh, we are we are on the right level uh, in Q1. Uh, I mean, we we have we have the right inventory level. It's not too much. It's not too little. Uh, and then, I mean, what's going to happen in Q2? We, we don't we don't really know. I mean, if uh, depending on what's going to happen, we, we we just have to adjust. But, but we don't really have any guidance for that. Okay. Thank. You. And the next question comes from the line of Klaus Berlin from City. Please go ahead. Um, yes, hi, Stefan and Thomas. It's Klaus from City. Just a couple of questions, please. Um, the first on SMS, and I want to come back to this. If you compare this business with Sandvik tooling back in the days, inventories have obviously come down. You've taken out fixed costs. A lot of factory closures since 2013. And it's obviously, as you say, it's impossible to comment on volumes ahead, but assuming that we would have a similar volume decline as during the financial crisis, Thomas, could you help us a little bit on, you know, likely effect from underabsorption, lower utilization? I think that that number in 2009 was over six billion. I mean, given the changes that you've done to the business, one would assume that the impact would be lower this time around. I know it's difficult to comment, but an indication would be great. Maybe you can take that one, Jeff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I mean. I think there's been a lot of good improvements in SMS. Obviously, uh, coming in here, uh, at least I've seen the actions that have been taken in, in the last years. Uh, it's footprint, of course. It's decentralization um, activities, which has both, I think, have had a positive from a cost uh, perspective, uh, but also now in terms of speed uh, of, of sort of taking actions uh, in, in a downturn. And I, I think what I can see, they have they have done it well so far. Of course, there's been a delay in these savings. It was structural or, or you know, savings that take a while to, to filter through, but they, they are doing what they said they were going to do. Um, we have a leverage in Q1 of 55% uh, on the operational side. Uh, which again, uh, it's a 3% EBIT drop uh, on a 12% negative uh, volume uh, drop. Uh, how how things will or would be uh, if, if things drop even more? I think it's very difficult to predict. I think the 55% in Q1 is as good as a guess as, as anything you, we can probably give you. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Um, then my, my second and final one is, is for you, Stefan, on, on M&A. Obviously, safeguarding margin and cash flow are the key priorities right now. But when we threw the paint here and when you start looking to engage more on the M&A front, what is your key takeaway when you look at SMS and joining the group and expanding into industrial software? And when you compare it to what you've done at your previous employer, is through M&A roll-up story in CAD CAM, metrology, so how can we see attractive synergies emerging? It would be interesting to, to hear your reflections so far when you've looked at this. Mm. 
Yeah, I want to be a little bit cautious. I'm still only, you know, two and a half months into it, not even, you know, past the first 90 days, and it's always easy to draw quick or too quick conclusions. Uh, I, I, I think we should definitely come back to it more during the capital markets day in the fall and so on around strategy. Uh, but what I can say uh, is uh, I, I think overall the strategy that we have in SMS around uh, you know, expanding a little bit out into the software and the value chain around component manufacturing. I think, I think it's a good strategy. I think there is merit to it. Uh, but I also know we have talked about it for some time, and uh, we see some good uh, movements lately. Uh, but we, we're definitely going to dig further into that. But I see potential there, definitely. Exactly what, how how big and so on, uh, I don't know. But I think there's merit to the strategy and there's definitely potential there. Thank you. And the next question comes from the line of Gail de Bray from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much and uh, good, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the first question I have is for Stefan. I, I know this is, uh, well, that's probably a follow-up on the earlier question. And, uh, these are exceptional times and you didn't get a lot of time, but fundamentally what has surprised you the most so far at Sondic in both uh, uh, positive and negative terms? Uh, so that's question number one. And question number two is about the level of activity in Q1 for SMS, which was perhaps not as bad as uh, one could have feared. Um, in your view, was there any sort of pre-buy effect in the first few months of the year with customers building up some inventories as, you know, they possibly fear that there could be some potential supply chain challenges? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'll start with the last one. Uh, I think it's more straightforward. Uh, I think we could see uh, early part of March or, you know, up until the drop uh, end of March, uh, that there were certain uh, regions where maybe we were a bit surprised at the activity level in a positive sense, and then I think we can only interpret that as uh, you know, buffer stocking, securing supply chain, uh, and so on. That, that was in March. Uh, it wasn't a lot, but, but it was noticeable. Um, then, of course, we had a drop at the very last week of March, so I think March overall, in that sense, uh, became as expected, but there were some dynamics uh, within March. Again, not, not, not a lot, but, but uh, it was not. Um, in terms of surprises, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a loaded question, because if you say something, it, it's what you say, you assume you wouldn't uh, find it. Um, I will say, as I said in the beginning, I'm, I'm really pleasantly surprised with the culture in the company and the passion among the people in the company. You meet a lot of people that have been here for 15, 20, 25 years, uh, but not in one role. They have been in different roles, different geographies, different business areas, different functions. So they have really made a career uh, in the company. Uh, and uh, I think that's really positive. It's built a strong culture and a lot of dedication that I mean, in a, in, a, in a situation like we are now, that can make a big difference. People go the extra mile um, despite troubling times and, and also health, uh, you know, related challenges. Um, on the negative side, I don't know. I'll come back to that when I've had at least 90 days to, to think about it. Okay. Thank you. And the next question comes from the line of Andreas Koski from Nordea. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, so firstly on uh, SMRT, uh, you mentioned that the aftermarket was down 2% in the quarter, but I wonder if that changed dramatically over the quarter and how did demand look like by the end of the quarter for the aftermarket businesses in SMRT? It didn't change dramatically across the quarter, but obviously, logistically, there were more challenges uh, in March and then towards the end of the quarter. Travel restrictions, you know, health-related uh, uh, you know, barriers in terms of visiting customers and so on, uh, but there was no dramatic difference 
Okay, so you didn't see close to a double digit drop in the off the market business at the end of March or something like that? No. No. And then the second question is on uh, on SMT. Uh, so when the internal separation of SMT was announced last year, I think it was made very clear that the board's ambition was to separately list SMT, uh, hopefully in the second half of this year. So has has that ambition changed? New CEO, or is that still the clear ambition? I, I, I don't want to comment on what the board's ambition was back then, uh, but I can tell you, to my knowledge, nothing has changed. That I can say. We are okay. proceeding according to plan, uh, and uh, then we will re we will discuss potential next steps when the internal separation is done uh, or later this year. Okay. Uh, so the ambition is to to separately list it. I, mean, I, I think what we, we have to say this. The, the formal decision that has been taken is to do an internal separation, and then uh, the board will evaluate potential next steps. That's what has been decided, and that's what I think uh, is, is, is clear. Then, of course, you don't start a process like this if you don't have a certain intention. Well, but there is a decision point and a discussion to be had once the internal separation is done. Okay, thank you very much. And the next question comes from the line of Edward Perry from HSBC. Please go ahead. Hi there. Yes, good afternoon, and um, thank you for taking my questions. Um, firstly, just to follow up on China and SMS, and I appreciate you mentioned the difficulties of interpreting the data so far, but has the recovery that you saw in March been maintained through the first weeks of April? And is the ramp-up in customer activity still as strong as your own ramp-up in production? Yeah, again, I, I don't want to comment on, on April numbers. Uh, in terms of customer activity, uh, I have to be honest and say I don't really really have that view. Uh, I, we can see what, what we are doing. Okay. Um, and then secondly, on the mining side, I mean, we've seen cuts to 2020 CapEx and production start to materialize over the last few weeks. Um, but from your own conversations with mining customers, what is your sense that these budgets will be rolled into and added back to 2021 budgets? Or do you feel spending timelines will simply be pushed further away into the next years? I'm sorry, I have to give a vague answer on that as well. Uh, I mean, we see hesitations, definitely. Uh, we have seen it for a while. It has... We, anything they strengthened end of, at the end of the quarter uh, and yes there has been announced uh, cuts in, in the capex whether that is just push outs postponed uh, investments or let's say uh, that they are gone uh, I, I don't really I cannot really answer that on behalf of them okay uh, you. You, never, you, know, you, you never know until afterwards. But the first first thing that happens in these big projects is, of course, they postpone it, and then they postpone mm -hmm. a bit more, and then they postpone it, and then they can maybe cancel it. Mm -hmm. So you can't really say uh, right now. Okay. Thank you both. And the next question comes from the line of Andrew Wilson from J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Stefan Thomas. Um, a couple of questions, please. Just on um, SMS and thinking about the, the cost base, and there's obviously been a lot of work done in, in the sense of, of adding the flexibility. Just wanted to get a sense of, of sort of where we are in terms of temporary labor in that business at the moment. I mean, do we have sort of those shorter time levers to pull? Obviously, you've got the bigger program, but just sort of how quickly can you be bringing people back on and off, given that there's clearly a huge amount of uncertainty in terms of almost week to week where demand develops? Just trying to get a, a sense of sort of how you're thinking about that? I mean, the short work week programs we are using, I mean, I think you are aware of you know, how they work in, in most regions, Germany, Italy, and so on. We, we have the Swedish program that's fairly new or very new. Um, they give quite a lot of flexibility, I have to say. But, of course, it, it's not that we can vary week over week. Uh, but... Uh, 
you can you can assume that we can adjust uh i would say on a monthly basis you, we have to be aligned with unions and so on uh, but uh, we have regular uh, you know touch base regularly and uh, we, we should be able to adjust fairly well on a month by month uh, basis uh, with these programs within reasonable you know, ranges uh, i assume that's helpful. Are there any particular regions which are uh, proving more difficult to kind of implement that sort of flexibility, or, or is it are you feeling pretty good about the flexibility all over the business? No, I think. I mean, we, we, if you look at where we have production and employees, uh, you know, Sweden, Finland have these programs, Germany, Italy. Uh, there is no, not really. Uh, that much flexibility than in countries like India and China. U.S. obviously a flexible labor uh, market. So it varies, but overall, I have to say, we, we are quite happy with the overall, let's say, impact we can have from these programs, uh, which is, of course, only the labor part. Then you have fixed assets, depreciation, and a lot of other fixed costs, but on the labor side, uh, there is some flexibility. Oh, that's uh, helpful. Thank you. Um, and then just one for Thomas, please, just to, I guess, following up a little bit on an earlier question, but thinking about working capital, um, if I kind of look through previous downturns at Sandvik, I can see that, you know, generally, albeit with a bit of a lag, there was a pretty good improvement in terms of working capital. Just any sort of help or kind of indications you can give us in terms of, of how we might see working capital develop over the next couple of quarters and, and sort of what what changes or processes you, you, you're sort of putting in place there to help drive that? Well, I, I, I can only give you a generic answer, really. But, but of course, I mean, the... Uh, of course, revenues were down 7% in, in, the, in the first quarter. Uh, so, so not, nothing, not, nothing much has, has really happened. Uh, but of course, I mean, going forward, uh, if, if, I mean, if we would uh, run into more negative numbers, of course, working capital would go down, and we'll have a nice uh, cash flow impact from, from that as well. That, that's just how it works. Uh, it has that, that's how it has worked previously, and this is how, how it will work uh, in, in the future. I mean, there are no specific measures or techniques or anything like that to, to manage that. Uh, I, I, would, uh, I would say that the decentralization and the distributed uh, ownership of, of all the various parts of working capital in the group is the most important uh, uh, tool for us, really, to manage it. Uh, that's very helpful. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you. And the next question comes from the line of Peter Testa from One Investments. Please go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for taking the question. Um, I was wondering if you could just help us a bit on the 1.5 billion of short-term cost savings, the extent to which um, these are really reflecting what you described on, on taking advantage of flexible labor programs um, or, or also including other costs, and maybe if, if um, you have further opportunity on flexible labor plans outside this 1.5. Yeah, I mean, a big part of the 1.5 is uh, the flexible labor programs. There are other things, you know, consultants, uh, discretionary spend, obviously travel, um, uh, project costs, and you know, things like that. Things that have a temporary, in a sense, but also immediate impact. Um, I mean, when we have um, looked at this, uh, you know, the, the various BAs and and divisions have made assumptions on how, uh, you know. The, the, uh, the volume will evolve throughout the year. Obviously, very, very difficult, but they have to do some assumptions in, in their modeling. Uh, and there are businesses that are sort of uh, planning to go in up a little bit again uh, later in the year, assuming there is some kind of recovery. If that would not happen, then obviously we can maintain those programs for longer. So in that sense, there is further potential, but not sort of in the short term, but more at the tail end of the year in that case. Okay. And, and the other question was just when most industrial companies are talking about um, restraining capex and, and in some industries cutting production rates, when you think about what you need to do with Sandvik through Q2 to kind of prepare yourself for 
these sort of customer responses and in, in later in the year? What sort of steps do you think you need to take? Where, where, are, you, where are you focusing to kind of prepare the organization for you know, the, this kind of customer, customer demand environment in H2? Well, I think that's what we have announced. Uh, I think uh, we, even though we announced uh, our activities end of March before, we actually saw the drop in SMS. Um, uh, we, we were, of course, were expecting uh, this to come in a way. So we took the actions we felt, based on the assumptions we have made, what were the right ones. And that caters for exactly what you say, production stoppages and CapEx uh, reductions among our customers and so on. So um, I feel we have the initiatives we, uh, you know, we need uh, with the, the knowledge we have at the, right now. Okay, so, so you do, don't feel the need to address on shift patterns or um, take account on working capital, sort of bringing as a percentage of sales more in line where, where it was a year ago and so on? I mean, shift patterns and so on, that is what we are adjusting now. That That's included sort of in the temporary labor uh, uh, yeah, activities. Uh, and Thomas showed also on, in the guidance, our own CapEx, uh, you know, is, is no longer at 4 billion, it's below 4 billion, so we are definitely reviewing that as well. Uh, on the networking capital, uh, I think Thomas has answered that. Uh, of course, also there, it's, it's you know, the, the basic uncertainty on, on, the, on the future is what makes this tricky to manage because we also don't want to uh, be out of stock when the uptick comes. So, so that's the, the constant balance we are, we are trying to manage here. Okay. Thank you very much for the answer. So, operator, I think we have time for uh, one last question before we summarize and conclude. The last question comes from the line of Madhvendra Singh from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, thanks for taking my question. Um, just following up on uh, the trends in Asia in uh, second quarter. Uh, in first quarter, Asia was uh, actually the source of the uh, virus outbreak. So, you know, obviously the impact was more there. But in second quarter, uh, given that the rest of the world actually is setting the, uh, in lockdown. Um, what kind of impact are you seeing in Asia because of that? Um, and secondly, on the uh, SMRT side, um, if you could talk about the trends on the services, um, are you facing um, difficulties in accessing customer, uh, you know, like the mines and the premises for the services? Um, and especially, you know, uh, in many of the mining markets, because, you know, the mines were closed, were you able to use any of those uh, shutdown times? For doing the uh, you know, essential maintenance, or uh, were you able to do any maintenance at all during that period using that downtime uh, at all? Thank you. If I start with the SMRT question, um, as I said earlier, we th there were some disturbances, especially in March, related to travel, logistics, access, uh, and so on. Uh, we don't, don't think this had a material impact, uh, but there were definitely disturbances uh, at the end of the quarter in that regard. Uh, you know, whether our customers now going forward will do more maintenance if they do closures and so on, I cannot really answer that. But I guess there is a reason for why they call it care and maintenance when they go into these production stoppages. But um, I cannot really comment on how how it would impact our service numbers. Uh, and then in terms of Asia and Q2, as I said, we don't really want to give any, uh, you know, any, any forecast for Q2 at this point. Okay, thank you. Okay, do you want to say uh, some final words, Stefan, for summary conclusion? Or? Well, I'll just uh, end the, sort of the way I started. I've, we feel this was a quarter that was largely aligned with our expectations. Uh, although the environment is challenging, uh, then of course uh, we are prepared now for a tough uh, period ahead, uh, as was indicated by by the developments in the very last week of March. Uh, but we have a solid financial position, and we are we are taking the actions we think are necessary. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.